Hello, everyone. Welcome to FitRx, and I'm your host, Dr. Greg Dennis. And as many of you know, especially if you listen to my introductory podcast, I began to question the, quote, standard of care a couple of years ago. And the reason I began to question it is because patients really weren't getting better. I was doing everything I was supposed to do in prescribing you know, the, the type of medications I was supposed to prescribe for given conditions, but patients were still sick. And so it just made me began taking a dive into maybe how to really get patients better, which what I found in most cases had nothing to do with prescribing medications. And so I've just barely scratched the surface on this, but it's one of those things that the more I dig into it and the more layers of the onion I peel back, the uglier it gets as far as, you know, our westernized modern healthcare. And as far when I say it gets ugly, it's just the, you know, the, the inadequacies of our healthcare system, the influence of, of big pharma, and all that. So uh, our next guest is going to help us take a deeper dive in that. And uh, he has researched this stuff in depth. And so his name is Dr. Robert Yoho, MD. He graduated from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. He did a residency in emergency medicine and is also trained in dermatology. He is board certified in emergency medicine and then also in cosmetic surgery. And he spent the uh, majority of his career doing cosmetic surgery and he's recently retired and now can add author uh, to his bio. Um, he is also has a long list of athletic accomplishments, which uh, I won't go into, um, so, Dr. Yoho, welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. Okay, well, well, let's start. So, you had a very successful practice, I'm assuming probably making good money. And so, what motivated you to start researching about the inadequacies of healthcare? So, just, just kind of walk us through the motivation you had in, in writing this, this book. Well, I was approaching the end of my career, I, you know, in my uh, middle 60s, and I had a number of, I had two fatalities in my surgical center, one of which wasn't uh, really related to my care, but it was a very distressing uh, problem. And I started reading more broadly than I ever had before. And I started reading general medicine, and I ran across um, what I call the corruption literature which is this, they're the skeletons in the closet of medicine. And I got into this stuff and I became more and more horrified. And I started to realize that uh, about 50% of what we do has been academically quite proven to not work at all. <laughs> and, and a lot of that is actually harmful to the patients. And I realized that the idealism with with which uh, we all started our careers had been completely trommeled over by corporate interests and the pursuit of money. And that the money that rains out of the sky from federal and insurance services, which elevates the cost to about twice what any other developed country spends per person, had completely ruined the uh, ethos that I started medicine with. And as I got uh, into it more and more, I just, it became kind of a obsessive compulsive attack. And I just, I just worked on it for three years and I came up with this book, which I've tried to edit down to uh, ninth grade level, which is, that's not easy to do with this subject matter. So uh, the whole thing is, I mean, I, I just basically became more and more distressed and uh, anguished over the situation as I learned more. And I'd been inside of, cos I'm like Rip Van Winkle, I'd been inside of cosmetic surgery strictly for about 30 years. So that, that was my start, and that's how I got into the whole thing. 
Okay. And I failed to mention the title of your book, uh, which is Butchered by Healthcare. So I feel like we're getting butchered by what's happening now in America and the rest of the world. But America's the worst because we have the most money to throw at it. And basically, a lot of these corporate interests will sell anything as long as they can slap a billing code on it. Okay. It's so, crazy. So let's, let's get into the book then. Um, and, you know, like I said, we'll just have to kind of hit the highlights here, but you go into most specialties and kind of the inadequacies of, of each one and what they do and the medicines they prescribe. <clears throat> but, you know, let's start with, let's discuss the influence of big pharma on our current guidelines. And I know that's a, a big subject, but talk, talk about that. Well, uh, pharma is well known to be a, a, a problem. And the, these companies are enormously powerful. They, you know, our gross domestic product is whatever it is, 22 trillion, or I, I'm not sure what it is, but pharma's worldwide gross revenues are 1.3 trillion now. This is just such a, a large, uh, you know, a large number. The, the top 10 pharma companies have uh, together have a larger gross revenue than the, than all but the top 10 countries or something like that. I mean, it's roughly, uh, so they're just, they're incredibly powerful. And the reason why they become so far powerful is we've just rained money out of the sky on healthcare. And these guys saw it and took advantage of it. And basically they are willing to ruin the studies that the FDA requires. We've got systems in place to try to keep these interests in line, but they have gamed the system to the point where most or, you know, an awful lot of what they do is uh, deception. And they, they have many methods to um, ruin studies. It takes a sophisticated eye to see it. And for example, they, they use inadequate dosing. That's the simplest way to think about it, inadequate dosing of a medication and compare it with their new drug. They conceal studies. They're allowed to do this currently because the studies are, are owned by the pharma company. So they will, for example, the antidepressants and the statin drugs, they concealed many, many studies, maybe half of the studies to allow through the ones that suggested the drugs worked. Now, I'm saying suggested because even the studies that are published hardly prove that these drugs are effective. They're not really. I mean, they, they have specialized uses perhaps, but we, are we better off with them or without them? I would maintain we're better off without both classes of drugs. Um, it's crazy the harm these things are doing. The advertising for the psychiatric drugs alone is so stunning that we have something like 20% of the populace in America taking these things. And arguably, they don't work at all. They now that's not the general consensus. The general consensus is at least that there are studies that suggest that they work in very sick people, right? So you've got these antipsychotics, and you, what are you going to do with these people but drug them up? I mean, you can't right. can't restrain them physically anymore. Um, so go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, well, I'd like to get into the specialties like psychiatry, cardiology, kind of talk about those individually here in just a minute, but but kind of back to big pharma. Uh, you mentioned in your book, you know, how they, they statistically manipulate uh, data, you know, to make it look good to us as providers. So, so, and talk about that. You talk about, you know, relative risk versus absolute risk and, you know, uh, numbers needed to treat, you know, things like that. So just talk about the statistical manipulation. Well, one of the central issues, now I'm just going to sidestep that for one second, but one of the central issues that I want to get in is judged by their criminal settlements. The pharma companies have been more, they're a more criminal organization than any other, his, any other, or any other group in history. I mean, they, these guys, every year they settle billions or nearly every year they settle billions in criminal, uh, criminal activities. And the federal prosecutors have allowed them to do this because it's, it's more, it's, it's very difficult to prosecute uh, anybody as wealthy as these guys. So, um, so anyway, I wanted to make that point. And then um, you want me to get into the ways that they manipulate things statistically? Yeah, just, just briefly. 
Well, they basically get away with anything. And um, I, I, let me, again, I'll sidestep that for another second, but um, profitable businesses in America and worldwide have 10% uh, gross profit margins. These guys, Pfizer has had a 40% to even 50% gross profit margins. And the only way you get this is the money rains out of the sky. So to get into the ways that they, they have, it's not, they, some of their studies are done abroad, maybe 80% now. And those studies are much easier to game. They hire these uh, groups called contract research organizations that um, are paid to uh, do the studies and ideally would do fair studies, but they don't get hired a second time when they produce negative or um, negative results or uh, results against the uh, manufacturer. So they gain this stuff. They hire statisticians. The statisticians subtly alter the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the approach to the, the med medications testing or, uh, or they subtly, they alter the, uh, uh, the patient populations being looked at, slanting the studies towards their, uh, their dr uh, drugs being approved. And then the FDA, which is paid directly by pharma, over half of their revenues are paid directly by pharma in the form of these user fees. The FDA um, will uh, rubber stamp these things if there's, if there's no uh, glaring uh, problem that's very, very obvious. So it's, it's kind of a system of handshakes and financial kickbacks. Yeah, and that was kind of disturbing to me when I read that because most people think of the FDA as being our safety net um, but it, it sounds like you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, there, I think you had in your book that they paid more than $3 billion in user fees. Uh, and that was back in, in 2016. And, and so it, I mean, it sounds like based on that, that, you know, uh, the FDA, you know, doesn't necessarily have our best interest because they're so financially tied to big pharma. Well, let's not, uh, well, there's, there's two points here. And the first is anytime money changes hands, you can't rel rely on results. And people think that doctors can maintain their integrity in the face of big payoffs. They think that um, there are people there and there are people at pharma with high integrity and, and ideals. But when money is involved, particularly the kind of money that we're seeing change hands here, the, the motivations are completely confused and, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just a sad scene because everybody's been bought off and it's a whole system of kickbacks right up to the Congress that maintains the advantages of pharma in the marketplace. One of the complex advantages that they, that's, it's seemingly innocuous, but one of the uh, advantages that they were able to uh, stick into uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare was this idea that they could pay the co-pays, right? and they could do copay reimbursement by having these programs. They did that illegally before the ACA uh, passed, but the ACA allows this. Now, the problem with this is it removes the last vestige of common sense in the system, which is the patient's reluctance to pay the copay. Now they can bill the insurance companies completely shamelessly without any, without any limit. The drugs go, they're not $200,000 a year, they're $500,000 a year or a million dollars a year. And the patient sees no impact whatsoever because the insurance companies can be billed directly without any copay. I mean, it's crazy. Wow. Um, well, let me change gears for just a second. I want to talk about uh, medical journals because if I'm having a conversation with a colleague about some of the things we're talking about, and, and I'm going to come back to statins here in a minute, but let's just use that as an example. And they're going to quote a study from a medical journal, journal that says, well, you know, this shows, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, but I want to read a couple of quotes that, that I believe I got from your book. One of them is from Richard Smith, who was an editor of the British Journal, uh, who says, medical journals are an extension of the marketing arm of pharmaceutical companies. Between two thirds th and three fourths of trials in major journals are funded by the industry. Uh, it mentions that half of journal revenues come from drug companies. And let me read uh, one more quote here. And this is from a former 
interim New England Journal of Medicine editor-in-chief, who has been quoted as saying, it is simply not possible to believe much of the clinical research that has been published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reach slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. So it sounds like we can't really rely on these journals, but if you want to get to the truth of things, you have to look outside of you know, our governing organizations like the American Heart Association and things like that and, and really dig deep to find you know, uh, trusted information. So just, just talk about that. Talk about the, the medical journals for a minute. Well, the journals have these massive advertising revenues. And now that, that quote uh, is not new. The journals are probably 90% uh, written by pharma and other sources. And they're, they're, they, they, here's an example of how the whole thing goes together. Um, the, reprint, the reprints are sold by the journals for these very expensive prices. It costs $40 to buy a paper. And basically, you can publish about anything in some of these journals as long as you agree to buy a certain number of reprints. So the reprints are a direct kickback to the journal. Um, the editors get direct paybacks. And Jason Fung is an academic uh, on, um, in uh, Canada. And he says, of all the journal editors that could be assessed, 50.6% were on the take. The average payment in 2014 was $27,564 each. This doesn't include an average of $37,000 given for research payments. Each editor of the Journal of the American Cardiology College of Cardiology received on average $475,000 personally and another $119,000 for research. I mean, these guys are all essentially paid off and they're the most sophisticated sources in medicine and they are working for these um, pharma companies and they only speak up after they've retired. And of course, I'm guilty of that too. So, I mean, it's, it's a crazy system. The big five most respected medical journals, Lancet, JAMA, BMJ, New England Journal of Medicine, the Annals of Internal Medicines are all contaminated with this commercial bias. The BMJ maybe is the least contaminated. Only 3% of its revenues come from reprints. Now, there are some fairly trusted sources. The Cochrane Collaboration is a, a meta-analysis organization, um, and they've done very well. Lately, they've had a couple of slips and their, their bias has been questioned, but you can look, for example, if you want to uh, learn about the efficacy of uh, influenza vaccines, well, which essentially don't work, um, you don't go to anywhere else but Cochrane, and they did the meta-analyses of all the literature, and they basically say they don't work, you know, just like Tamiflu doesn't work at all, you know, it's, I mean, it's billions and billions and billions in revenues, and they've been hyped, and <clears throat> these governments have stockpiled all this stuff, and it doesn't work. So, I mean, I, Gotcha says it best. He said the pervasive scientific misconduct has led to a research literature where one has to dig deeply to find a few gems among all the garbage. And uh, so, I mean, it is possible to learn from medical literature, but, you know, perusing the most recent stuff doesn't do you any good. Some sources suggest that no drug that's less than seven years old should be even considered for use. So, you know. Yeah, very good. Um, so let's get into some of the different specialties. And so we'll, we'll just make all kind of enemies here. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's start with cardiology. Um, so talk about just some of the the inadequacies in, in the field of cardiology. Uh, and, you know, we, we mentioned briefly statins and, you know, statins, in my opinion, are way overprescribed. Uh, one cardiologist, I can't remember who it was that quoted this, but he, he said that cholesterol is one of the biggest scams in our modern day history. And so as a primary care doctor, as I began researching this and I'm like, okay, what do I not know? Because that's always been taught as just 
medical dogma. You know, if your cholesterol is high, you know, you got to be on a statin, you know, that needs to be statins need to be in the water. But as I've dug into this, I've realized that it, it's not black and white. There may be some few, a few cases for them, but in general, you know, statins are probably not necessary. And that's just one example, but uh, talk about that and just talk about other things uh, about cardiology that you found in your research. Okay. So a cardiology consists of multiple specialties and they, they obviously they do a lot of good and they, they have, there are some miracles that they do. Um, they can cure some arrhythmias essentially for years by burning parts of the wiring system of the heart. And it just seems like they got some of this stuff from, from Star Trek, you know, Dr. McCoy. Um, they, these guys work really hard. They're, they're superior doctors in general. Um, the, and they, they've been very, uh, clever about uh, trying to solve uh, one of the biggest problems, which is coronary artery disease. So they have this uh, invasive cardiology field where they stick these um, little mesh uh, devices into coronary arteries. And it's almost miraculous how it's done technically. They stick these things in and they pry open closed areas. And then they develop these um, uh, drug uh, secreting uh, devices of the same ilk, right? And so for a long time, that was seen to be a miracle because mechanistically, it looked like it worked, right? Opening up things looked like, looks like it would cure the disease, which is generally localized uh, constrictions of cholesterol and other things. Well, when this is studied carefully, it turns out almost doesn't work at all, right? And so when it was studied carefully, they were only able to find one, um, one area that worked, and that was in the treatment of acute STEMI heart attacks, which is the severe kind of heart attack where EKG, the EKG or the cardiogram shows the real problem. People can have a heart attack without much many EKG changes, but this thing is obvious. And in those um, cases, it was the statistics show the number needed to treat is 40, right? So one patient is saved for every 40 people um, treated. Well, 95% of the people treated in America, roughly, I mean, maybe 90, maybe 85% are treated in the absence of a heart attack. In these patients, it's well established that it doesn't work at all, right? I mean, 95, and they often will send these patients in through the emergency room claiming they have, quote, unstable angina, which has a very vague definition. So, you know, these guys are busy censuring each other for putting in too many stents in one year. There's some, some fellow in the East Coast that, uh, that was uh, made four or five million dollars in a year doing it, and he, he was censured and all that stuff. But Basically, it's a very common practice, and the whole thing is built upon the people who are actually having STEMI heart attacks, where there's some evidence that the, the thing works. Now, I'm going to tell you why it doesn't work, in my opinion, but the rest of it, 95 or 85 percent of it, is, as far as I can tell, without any evidence that it works at all. Now, in the case of a STEMI heart attack, where the number needed to treat is 40, they kill about three and a half percent of them doing that, as opposed to the other ones who, uh, who they kill about half a percent. And the, this uh, angioplasty was um, touted as the safe way to treat acute coronary disease, right? Well, you still kill three and a half percent. But if you do the math and you're killing three percent more than the other, that's a number needed to treat a 40. So it's a wash. So in my opinion, this stuff doesn't work at all. Now, if you multiply the cost, I'm, I'm sorry if this is too much math, but if you multiply the cost of each uh, intervention, um, you'll find out that even if you accept that number needed to treat of 40, um, the cost of each intervention is a million and a half or two million. So this is more than the accepted cost to save a life in America. It, the accepted cost to save a life is a million. And that's even that's crazy. Because if we were to need all of our lives saved by some medical intervention, it, you know, with 330 million people or whatever it is, it would cost more than the gross domestic product of the entire world. I mean, the, the, the numbers are incomprehensible. But I basically don't think 
that angioplasty should be done at all. I think it's, and this is heretical, but uh, most people haven't looked carefully at the numbers and uh, the, 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 these guys continue to do it and it's, it's for the, uh, the huge payouts. I mean, it, it, you know, the, their fees are, are incomprehensible. They have to do very little for it. It's amazing. So what would be the alternative? So let, let's just say you're having some stable angina. You find that uh, you have a, a blockage. You know, you, you just mentioned all the statistics. So it doesn't sound like you would undergo, you know, a stent yourself. I mean, I know you're not a cardiologist, but I mean, what, what are some alternatives that, that would be out there? Well, this is not an easy solution for most people, but um, controlled fasting reverses all this in many cases. And Jason Fung is a good source of this. If you can interview him, I'm, I, you know, that, that would be, he, he's, yeah, I'm, he's a, a I'm a huge, huge advocate of fasting. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, so I mean, I can tell you that, um, you know, this may be an unpleasant thing to say or bring up, but um, there were groups of people who were, um, uh, had autopsies on them during their, this forced starvation in concentration camps, and coronary artery, artery disease was unknown in that group. So without getting into that anymore, that's another line of evidence that it works. Now, the drugs, those statin drugs do work a bit on one group, and that is um, the people who've already had a heart attack. And, and those people, you should try anything you can because you're not going to get them to starve themselves. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's like a, a real, you know, it's something that very few people can do. Right. But um, I tell you, if I had unstable angina, I'd think very carefully about my next uh, meal. And I'd think about, um, you know, doing these fasts, which go from 12 hours to uh, three or four days. And uh, Fung has a series of patients, which is uh, really remarkable. I don't know whether you've had a chance to look at his books, but it's, it's an impressive, impressive uh, thing. They've gotten, they've thrown away their diabetes medications. All these yep. uh, diseases, uh, hypertension, diabetes, and uh, heart disease are, are diseases of overconsumption. And uh, if we can somehow, we'd almost have to go to a uh, place that where we didn't have access to all the food, you know, go to Japan or something where, where everybody's thin. I, I went to Asia and I never seen such thin, good looking people as Korea, Korea and Japan. Right, right, yeah, good advice. Uh, so uh, you do not think we should have statins in the water? <laughs> well, that, that was the trope when I was training. When the first came out, it seemed like they were miracle drugs, but they have a whole series of problems and side effects. And uh, the cardiologists and the other people prescribing will minimize these, but they're everything from impotence to, uh, I mean, to death from the, the muscle damage. And uh, so, I mean, it's abs I mean, I don't know what percent are on statins. It's at least 10% of the populace. It's utterly crazy. Yeah, no, I bet it's more than that. And, uh, yeah. you know, as, as a primary care doctor, I can just say, and it's hard to get this message out to the cardiologist. And, and I mean, this could be a whole podcast just on, you know, statins. And a matter of fact, I'll probably have one, but we're looking at the wrong things. It's, it comes back to metabolic dysfunction, as you were saying, which is treated by things like fasting. It's not cholesterol. It, it, we're, we're focusing on the wrong things. But, but like I said, that could be the only, episode, so. the only two groups that have been shown to benefit and the benefits are small. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's like that number needed to treat a 40. People think they are going to the cath lab to get saved. Well, they're getting, going to the cath lab to have a, a small percentage chance of not having an adverse consequence. But the only two people who, the only two kinds of patients who benefit from statins are hereditary hyperlipidemia, which means very high uh, cholesterol, and it's familial. And that's a small, small number of improvement due to that. And then the ones that have already had a heart attack. Yeah. So. And, and I would even go a step further. Uh, I saw something where those uh, hereditary uh, hyperlipidemia, those that had no insulin resistance, had no increased risk of coronary artery disease, and that group that had insulin resistance, of course, it was, it was significant. So even these cholesterol or high cholesterol numbers, and we're talking really, really high with familial hyperlipidemia, without insulin resistance, I think it's pretty meaningless. So, um, okay. So 
we'll jump into the next uh, kind of specialty of psychiatry and reading your book. I, I know you love these SSRIs and all these psychiatric drugs. So uh, kind of talk about that a minute. Well, I spent um, a career prescribing SSRIs. Um, you know, I read Peter Kramer's Listening to Prozac early. I sort of jumped on the bandwagon. I was initially a primary care physician. I thought the things worked based on evidence I read in sources like that. Um, the psychiatry is the only field in medicine that has a whole group of people besides Scientologists who think that they really are almost completely ineffective and should not be practicing. And this group, the quote, psychiatry deniers, there some psychiatrists are in it, but um, the, the, um, the, the person who kind of got the whole thing quantified pretty well was uh, Robert Whitaker. And he's a journalist and he dove into that literature. At first he believed the, the, uh, the, the marketing messages. Um, depression is like a brain disease, which is like um, uh, diabetes and uh, the SSRIs are like insulin, right? But um, then he dove into the literature and found out that there were no control groups no adequate control groups uh, who didn't receive medicine in any of the, in, in most of the studies about the SSRIs. And uh, basically his conclusion was that these drugs were very damaging and that they were, they, we've gotten to the point we, I don't know what percent of the people in the country are on SSRIs, it must be 15%. I, I've got the exact figures in my book, but, um, we, we just pass these things out to anyone with an adjustment disorder who walks in a primary care's office now. I mean, it's just absolutely crazy because they're very addictive. It's very hard to get off of them. It's very hard to distinguish the withdrawal of the drug from addiction. In other words, you, you try to get off this drug and the syndrome, syndrome comes back, whatever you had to begin with, the anxiety or the depression. So these are powerful mental agents that are being vastly overused. There is some evidence that maybe we should use them for the people who are, um, you know, can't get out of bed, but then they create an increased risk of suicide and violence. And this is not well appreciated. It's, it's, it's clear from the very first studies. And the people that are into this literature um, now believe that many of the mass shootings and the, the school shootings and all this were either associated with SSRI withdrawal or SSRI uh, consumption. Um, so so these, this is a very powerful and questionable set of drugs. And it's, it, the, the real sin here is it's prescribed to a vast swath of our populace. It's not held in reserve for the really sick ones. Now, that's one out of the four psychiatric drugs. The others have problems too. Yeah. And I can go into that if yeah, you want. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, talk about those. Okay. So another class of these things is called the atypical antipsychotics. And they were billed as having um, less side effects than the original antipsychotics. Now we had these older antipsychotics. They were like a big hammer that we hit people over the head with, and they would stop behavior, they would uh, calm people down and so on. And you, people have heard of Thorazine, that's one of them. But um, the atypical antipsychotics were billed as having less of the, the most uh, well-known side effect, which is called tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dys dyskinesia, the patients, you know, move this mouth in a funny way. They have various other pro motor problems. They, you know, move their arms in an uncontrollable way, their head. They, they, but there's four or five other syndromes. They were these, the modern studies show rates of tardive dyskinesia that are very similar to the original antipsychotics. So this was fraudulent. And um, these drugs, they kill you 10 to 20 years earlier. They, they give you hypertension and coronary disease and other problems, and they are, they're, they're bad for your health. So those things are now commonly prescribed even to children for all kinds of things. They start out with the SSRIs, they, they use a little atypical antipsychotic, they add in the stimulants, which are, it's an outrageous thing. The stimulants are now, now used, these are very old drugs that have, we've known about them since before World War II. And uh, in many other countries, they're not 
they're considered um, a very dangerous. They, they keep them out of the country. I mean, it's, they only allow one. We have four or five of these things. They're variants of the same thing. And they're being used. They were, they were first made available for children, uh, these hyperactive children. And they, they do calm down children, but it's, it's, it's crazy, the health problems they cause. And uh, they actually cause physical problems. There's well-documented brain shrinkage. And the people get on this, and they're stuck on it indefinitely. So those are, those are several of the uh, classes of uh, psychiatric drugs. Um, the, other, the other, I mean, these guys, I've got a friend who's a high functional physician, and he had a, a problem that resulted in um, some legal issues. And the psychiatrist got a hold of him, and he's on five of these things, and he's on two anti-seizure medicines that are now commonly used on top of everything else. They're very unpleasant seizure medicines. One of them was Lamictal. He's on Ritalin, which is a stimulant. He's, he's on an antidepressant. And he's on an atypical antipsychotic. I mean, it's crazy. He'll never get off that stuff. I mean, he's, he will not come back to any kind of functional status unless he can somehow withdraw. And, and I didn't even mention the, the one, the, the yesteryear's big addiction problem, which was the benzodiazepines. And those are the Valium class drugs. And I mean, he, it's, it's, those things are used promiscuously. And they're, they're, not, they're not probably as dangerous as the SSRIs and the rest of it, in my opinion. But people get addicted to that stuff too, all commonly. And they're, they're on it for years. And just to get off that alone takes months of agonizing tapering of the dose. I mean, it, it, and the people have uh, withdrawal syndromes that include depression and anxiety, severe anxiety. Uh, so let's move on to maybe surgery uh, as another specialty. So talk about, I believe you talked in your book about surgeries um, and, and maybe a lot of unnecessary surgeries. So talk about that for a minute. Well, the counterpart to the angioplasty in surgery is coronary artery bypass grafting. And this has been I mean, we're spending just an enormous amount of money on this, about as much as we spend on angioplasty. And this is almost completely ineffective as well. It's been, and when I say ineffective, what I'm saying is that the improvement in deaths or mortality is nominal, right? It, you know, they've got, there's all kinds of ways to study drugs and surgery <clears throat> that don't involve uh, studying death. Death is the hardest of endpoints, right? Like, for example, in cancer chemotherapy, they can, they can study tumor size reduction. Well, who cares if your tumor size reduces if you're dying at the same minute or statistically in the same six-month period? Um, so um, the deaths, death improvement or the mortality improvement with coronary artery bypass graft thing is nominal. And their evidence is based on one small group, right? They, they operate on all kinds of different coronary artery blockage syndromes, but one small group has coronary artery blockage of the left main artery, which is a little two centimeter section of artery from which two of the three arteries uh, spring down, downstream. The blood flows downstream. Well, if that one is 80 or 90% blocked, plumbing around that produces an improvement in mortality. But listen carefully, it only improves uh, the fatality rate by 20% at five years, right? So that's the entire benefit for all coronary artery surgery of all kinds. The rest of the coronary artery surgery, which they, they, they call it left main equivalent, which is um, all three coronary arteries are blocked. There's no evidence that that helps mortality at all, right? So it's just this one small subgroup, and that's the entire um, uh, foundation of the, of the whole teetering edifice of coronary artery uh, surgery. So, I mean, it's an, it's an enormous industry. It, it pays them to do it, and uh, it's, just, it's just crazy. Okay. Um any other specialties you want to pick on uh, before I'm going to ask you about uh, medical devices, but uh, in anything, anything else? Well, there. the oncologists um, 
are hardworking people, just like we all are. And they deal with problems that I would hate to deal with. And they, in the best of them, must do a lot of emotional counseling during uh, people people's demise and, and decline. Uh, but they have this incredible conflict of interest. And that is that the vast bulk of their income comes from retailing cancer drugs. And this, this is a conflict of interest that is so massive that it is pro prohibited between physicians. In other words, if, if I were to pay you to refer me patients, right, that would be called capping. And that is a federal crime. Well, the, somehow the corporations get away with allowing, with paying these guys kickbacks and pushing them to prescribe uh, the drugs based even on the milligrams of dosing. So these guys are motivated in some cases to prescribe larger doses of a drug than they would by financial incentives. I mean, it's absolutely insane. And so as I've said earlier, whenever money change hands, changes hands, the, the, uh, the, the, the well is, is poisoned. And so these guys can't even distinguish for themselves what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're prescribing these drugs. I mean, and the newer drugs are more expensive. And so whether they work or not, I mean, they probably do work better, but whether they work or not, there is an incredible financial incentive to prescribe the most expensive possible thing. Now, some of the, there are things that these guys cure. I mean, obviously testicular cancer, the lymphomas and, um, multiple myeloma, the strides have been very expensive, but it's impressive and, and several other things, a, a handful of syndromes. But in the vast majority, um, it's about two months of improved survival for whatever the heck they're doing. And many of these things, these diseases have been hyped because we're picking them up earlier because of screening programs when the actual fatality rates have been rock solid. In other words, the, the true incidence in the population is unchanged, but the, the numbers that we're seeing have increased. So we're, we're, we claim that we have an epidemic of melanomas or an epidemic of thyroid cancer or an epidemic of kidney cancer. None of it's true because the mortality is the same. And so anyway, the disease incidence is identical and we're, we're not curing anymore. So... Um, CPR is basically a fraud. I don't know whether you understood this from your training, but the emergency physicians all understand this. Every part of it, primarily the drugs, have been, have been shown not to work at all. I mean, the, the, uh, the shock thing, I mean, that, that gets people out of uh, bad rhythms and that does cure people if you catch them early. Um, CPR in the street, there's a Japanese study and a few percent uh, benefit, but uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And you, you mentioned in the book, uh, some of the, uh, screenings that we do like, you know, colonoscopies, uh, things like that. Uh, and so, so talk about those a little bit. Well, this is, this is almost a religious, uh, icon among physicians that colonoscopies and mammograms, for example, have benefit. But when you dive deep into the mathematics of it, um, the colonoscopies, for example, have a very small, uh, even mortality rate, and they produce many, many operations, which each have um, side of complications and even a small mortality rate. So the net improvement in deaths from doing colonoscopies on people who have no symptoms and no problems is zero. Now that's heretical, but it's pretty well worked out by the authors I quote. Um, mammogram, uh, you know, of course, now, if you've got hereditary polyposis, or if you have bleeding in your, from your rectum, or if you have symptoms, you know, abdominal pain, it's perfectly reasonable to get a colonoscopy. It's a, it's a modern miracle. I mean, you can see the inside of the colon for crying out loud, mm -hmm. but um, for screening purposes, it's worthless. And it's not done in other countries like it is in the United States. Um, mammograms, are a feminist issue, it's considered politically correct, but the problems with mammograms are not that they get radiation, it's, it's, it's not that it's a dangerous process, it's exceedingly expensive, um, and it spawns a whole network of other minor and major procedures 
that in 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 the 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 sum of it all it doesn't work to improve lifespan and you can imagine it picks up tumors that sometimes would regress and go away and it picks up things that would that you would die with and not from and um it uh, it it basically the math doesn't work on mammograms either the way you should think there's a screening group called the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, USPSTF, I think. Mm -hmm. And they come, they, um, um, they come across with, uh, you know, recommendations for all sorts of screening. But uh, the best uh, opinions about screening is that virtually none of it works and it shouldn't be done. And I know, I know that's heretical in America. But these things aren't done in other countries, even first world countries, where where they're they're theoretically have medical care that's equal to ours, but costs half of what ours does per capita. Singapore gets away with about five percent of their gross domestic product, um, and ours is almost twenty percent. So it's a quarter of our cost, and they've got very good care. And these other countries, France, France, Germany, England, Canada, and so on, they're spending ten percent of their GDPs, and they're they this whole group, the whole group of the other first world countries. They live longer than we do on average. Their mortalities are, are better, slightly better, but still better. So they're, they're spending less. And my premise is, is that it's due to over-doctoring and over-treatment. So is there any screening out there that you recommend that you know, statistics would back up that is worthwhile? Well, I don't think so. And the smartest guy in the room is this Stanford, uh, Stanford epidemiologist physician named John and I always get this name uh, uh, pronounced wrong, Ionides, how do you say his name? But, but he, he basically said that there's no screening that works. I can, let me see if I can quote exactly what he says here. Anyway, it doesn't, I, I, can't, I can't access it. But, uh, but anyway, I don't think any screening test works. Now, what about pap smears? <laughs> this is very controversial, but just think of what we're doing with pap smears. And I'll just give you a few of the, uh, a few of the numbers. Only 4,000 people die a year from cervical cancer in the United States, right? Lung cancer is, I must be over 100,000. I mean, it's a, it's a much bigger phenomenon. For pap smears, we screen every woman of reproductive age during this entire period. It's embarrassing, humiliating, and the tests are inaccurate. They have to be interpreted by a pathologist. It's a very expensive process. And arguably, this doesn't work either. But I don't make that claim in my book because, it, you know, the numbers are more complicated. And that's, that would be less politically correct than anything else I said. And I, I mean, I was, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't uh, stand on the politically correct stuff. Okay. Well, let me ask you about uh, medical devices, because you talk a little bit about that in the book. And so what, uh, what's your take on some of the medical devices that are out there? Well, medical devices are miracles in some ways, right? We've got our cataract replacement. I've had uh, bilateral cataract replacement and I can, I can see pretty well without my glasses. I can't see type, uh, you know, but uh, <clears throat> cardiac uh, pacemakers, there are many, many success in medical devices, but these companies are essentially similar to pharma and they are almost without um, conscience or interest in anything but the money. And I want, you know, I make a claim like that and it can be backed up because their criminal settlements and civil settlements are colossal. Um, and I did a partial legal history of Medtronic in my book. I mean, they paid 75 million in 2008 to settle false claims relating to bone cement products, 23 million in 2011 for paying money to doctors, for implanting pacemakers and defibrillators, 85 million, it just goes on and on and on. And so they combined with pharma as measured by their criminal settlements are the most criminal organizations in any industry in history. Now that's a big claim, but think about it. Who has paid out billions and billions of dollars often every year? And there's a Wikipedia hall, uh, a page. If you just Google Wikipedia pharmaceutical payouts, right? And you can read all about that stuff at the top 20 companies or whatever. But um, the, uh, the device companies are, are very similar. Now, um, these guys, 
have come up with a lot of ideas and some of them sound like they'd work. I mean, they, they pump, they, uh, there's a book written by Janine Linzer uh, about implantable vagal nerve stimulators. And this was a boondoggle. It was marketed very heavily and uh, basically they work very poorly and they create a lot of fatalities. Um, which is the vagus is a nerve that um, supplies the gut and other parts of the, the body. And they, they put a, a little machine that gives electrical. Uh, uh, and the, the, the indications for this thing have gone to depression, anxiety, atrial fibrillation, autism, bulimia. It's, it's a, a diagnosis creep, just like the pharma drugs. And they're, they're all off-label. It's only approved for a couple of things. The cardiac stents I mentioned, those are devices. Um, the Escher was a widely um, publicized uh, female sterilization thing where they stuck a coil of metal in a woman's fallopian tubes, and they didn't even make a coil that was absent nickel. And you're probably familiar with nickel allergy. It's a topical allergy any dermatologist is familiar with, and even, even the, the uh, jewelry manufacturers are familiar with nickel. They don't, you know, the quality jewelry manufacturers don't put nickel in their jewelry because they'll get rashes. Well, this Escher group, they manufactured something that was a little cheaper. Um, and they, they, anyway, so it didn't work. The things broke apart. There was this film called The Bleeding Edge, um, which is an expose about women damaged by the product. Hernia mesh has been restricted finally after many, many disasters. But things like IUDs and um, hip replacements are are miracles. And I think breast implants are great. I think that a lot of women have their, women have their lives changed by them, even though they've got complications and problems. Okay. Um, well, as we're wrapping it up, anything else that, uh, that was in the book that, that we didn't talk about that you think is just important to, to throw out there? Well, these, any, any kind of reform is resisted very heartily by institutions and they've got so much money we're essentially paying them to lobby against us and do whatever they want and they have complete license so um i don't i don't hold out a great deal of hope for um national reform or healthcare improvement or any of that stuff and anything they do tends to pump more money into the industry affordable care act started out as a uh, i mean they tried to do a lot of things but uh and they did a few things to improve coverage and so on, but they ended up doing, uh, they ended up pumping more money in industry. So I think your best approach to this as a patient and as an individual is to develop your own personal healthcare philosophy and realize that there's only so much that we can do and that uh, good, good health is uh, diet and exercise and um, you should try to be sanguine or um, not too anxious and not declining health as you get older and not expect medicine to save you. So that's, um, that's, uh, that's all I've got to say, I guess. Okay. And actually that was going to be my, my final question, which you kind of answered. Uh, it was kind of a two part question. One is with everything you just said, what is, what is a patient to do, you know, with this information, uh, which you just answered. And so kind of the second part to that question is, what are we as physicians to do? You know, you, we talked about how we can't really trust the, the medical journals that we're getting our information from. And uh, you're, you're kind of towards the end of your career. I'm about in the middle of mine. But uh, for people like myself, for young physicians just starting out, like how do we, how do we use this information to, to help our patients? Because ultimately, that's, that's why we got into this field. Well, the strangest thing about this whole thing that I got into is it's not well known among physicians, all this corruption. And there, there's a, a saying that came from somewhere that said that a man has a great deal of uh, trouble deciding about anything that influences his salary. So we're physician, we physicians are stuck in the point of trying to make a living. Now, the physicians that are working for a salary, um, they have less conflict of interest, but they often have standards in place that the big um, corporate entities put in place that influence, um, you know, the uh, the standards at uh, Kaiser and other um, other uh, HMOs and so on. So it's not an easy thing. But the first thing I would suggest is I would suggest 
reading my book, which is now available as a free download at D-R-Y-O-H-O, Dr. Yoho, author.com, if you don't mind if I plug it. I, nobody does this for money. And I certainly don't expect to make any money on this effort, but my book is an outline and I've got 500 references and um, about 75 books in there that you can uh, read to reference um, and to, to develop your own opinions about the whole thing. I don't expect physicians to believe everything that I said on this podcast without looking very carefully at it. And my message is not that any tree in this forest is definitely rotten, right? A lot of them are. I want you to look at the whole forest and realize the whole system is set up to make money for corporate interests and the physicians are making money too, of course. So it's, it's a crazy thing. And I think if you're aware of what's going on, that's the first step to, um, to correcting your, your, and, you know, maintaining your idealism with the patients. And I mean, it's a very difficult sales process to get the patients to believe that, that there's no pill that's going to solve their problem. Yeah, no, it's, it's an uphill battle. Uh, I've, I've realized so. Well, very good. Uh, so the name of the book is butchered by healthcare and you, uh, mentioned where they could find it. I think it's also available on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, you can download it. So thank you for doing all the research that you've done and bringing all of this information uh, uh, you know, to light. Uh, one final question, and uh, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but um, I ask all my guests at the end to give us one health tip as we leave that can uh, just make us healthier today. What would you say? Well, <laughs> I think, you know, I learned personally that um, not all of the, uh, I, I think, I think that you shouldn't be completely cynical about what medicine can do. And I think half of it works pretty well. And some of the new stuff, which is very expensive, uh, uh, works very well. And, um, so you've got to do your research and you've got to figure out what's going on. And some of the big universities have some very motivated and talented people there. I mean, it, it's to, to, to become an academic at Stanford or Harvard or Yale, it's a fraction of a percent of the applicants. So the residents and the physicians at a big center, um, it may not cost you any more to go there if you have an unusual problem, uh, but you can, you, can, um, you can access talent that you can't imagine. Um, and the, the costs are unbelievable, but if you have Medicare, you're largely protected from that. If you have other insurances, um, maybe you're partially protected. Uh, but, uh, but I don't want to put forth the opinion that nothing works. And that, that seems to be the opinion of the alternative community that they should just take vitamins and eat happy and all this stuff. That's not true, but it is true that about half of it has been pro proven not to work very well and maybe 20% of it or whatever actually is probably harmful of all the medicines we offer. And, and it's, it's available. You can look, look for that stuff on the internet. So my message is um, do your research and take charge and um, don't let anybody feed you anything that you don't compare with other sources, especially when it's uh, when life and death is on the line. For sure. Okay. Well, Dr. Robert Yoho, uh, we appreciate it. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Greg. And uh, thank you guys. And we will see you next time. All right. Well, very good. Well, that went great. I, I appreciate it, Greg. I felt yeah. like I was halting, but it was my first one. <laughs> uh, no, you did great. I like I said, I, I, uh, I've realized as I've started doing this, um, I, I have a lot of pauses and a lot of ums. Um, and I'll edit a lot of that out. And so I'll, I'll do my best to, to make you and me, you know, sound as good as we can. Uh, so it's always, hopefully the end product is, is always better, you know, than the original. So um, I don't know when this will, uh, you know, will go out. Uh, like I said, I'm, oh, I try to stay about a month, uh, at least a month ahead on, on shows. And so, you know, probably be maybe sometime into November. I don't know, but if you want, I can, you know, shoot you an email when it goes out. I really appreciate it. And so I can see yeah. the link. Sure. What yeah. is the name of your show? Uh, Fit RX. Fit RX. Okay. Yeah, F I T R X. Yeah. Fit RX, Dr. Greg Dennis. So yeah, like I said, I've only got a couple of, uh, 
couple of show or episodes right now. I've got an introduction and then I've got a part one and part two on fat burning. Um, and uh, so far it's been received, you know, really well. So you might be able to get some of these uh, people I referenced in this book to uh, be on your show. I, yeah. you know, I've got some of their emails and uh, I, you know, I don't know whether they're still interested. A lot of them have been toiling with this stuff for years and yep. you know, it's a very, it's a pirate uphill battle, you know? Sure it is. Yeah. But I, I'm a huge Jason Fung fan. I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd, eventually I'd love to get him on the show. Um, and matter of fact, I, I reference him a lot in my fat burning talks because uh, he's done a lot of research, obviously on, on, uh, you know, losing weight and, and the fasting. And so, yeah, I'm a huge fan of his. So I've got his email if you want me to send it to you. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. 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 If, yeah. If you don't mind just sending that through, through email, text or whatever. And yeah, I guess he's got a new book coming out here pretty quick uh, about cancer, the cancer code. I think I haven't, haven't downloaded yeah. it yet, but anxious to read that one. So I um, find it hard to fast. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I do it. Um, so I do some uh, intermittent fasting, meaning like 16 hours, several times a week. And then I, I do a 24 hour fast, uh, every Sunday. I just don't eat, I just don't eat on Sundays and I'm, I'm pretty lean. Um, matter of fact, I'm very lean. I mean, I'm real into fitness and, um, and so, you know, I tell patients, I'm like, as lean as I am, if I can fast for 24 hours, then, you know, you can, you can fast for 24 hours. And I want to do, uh, and, and I'm probably this fall, I'm going to do an extended fast for, I don't know, three to three to five days. A good friend of mine went five days and he's probably leaner than I am. And, uh, I'm like, I don't know if I can do five, but I'll try, I'll try three. Um, but no, I, that was great advice. I mean, because yeah, fasting just has so many benefits. So you don't think I said anything that was uh, libelous or politically incorrect that would get me hassled? No, no, no. I tried to be good to everybody. I, I really think that psychiatrists are very sick. I mean, yep. it's a sad deal and I'm, I'm angry about everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually have a friend of mine, uh, and he's, he's a really good guy. I don't, I, he's, he moved out of state. I don't talk to him all that much, but he's a psychiatrist. Why he went into that field. I don't know. Cause he was a smart guy. I mean, yeah. he could have he gone into a lot of different fields, but, um, anyway, he, he hates it. <laughs> he, yeah. He, he hates his job. So I don't think anything you said, uh, I, I might, um, you know, I might send him that podcast link and just, you know, get his, his thoughts on it. But I don't think anything you said uh, he would would disagree with because I, I know he just he doesn't like his job. You know, so send him send him my book. Yeah. Yeah. You send him a link to the free download. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time. No worries, Greg. And we'll uh, be in touch. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, you have a great day, sir. Thank you. OK, Bye. take care.